about uh, 27, 28 years now. We do mostly corporate work, um, some social work, but we focus mainly on um, the, the corporate special event world, trade shows, meetings, incentive meetings, um, meeting stages. We also do some museum work, some themed retail work, um, and if we're really pressed, some high-end custom home stuff, which I hate to do because they're just never happy. They have a lot of money, but they're never happy. So this is my creative design process. I'm sure you've all seen this floating around the web. It really works like that. I scream and yell. Um, I want to talk about it, though. Uh, a lot of people get into the design process and, and they approach it sometimes from a very dry place. And one of the things I've been talking about the past few years is trying to change the way we think, trying to come up with a new <coughs> way of thinking about design because um, it's not about, always about stuff, it's not always about technology, it's about creativity at its core. And um, if you depend upon the creativity, you'll be successful. Because the one thing that you have that no one else has is your ideas. Um, a lot of uh, things that we do in our industry are commodity based. If I need a sound system, I can rent these speakers in this sound system from any number of companies. It's all the same stuff. If I'm here in Nashville, or I'm up in Boston, or I'm across the country in California, the speakers are the same, the, the sound boards are the same, the microphones are the same, nothing changes. So when you approach your design work, think about that. Think about what's a commodity and what is your unique property, your ideas, because those are the important things. Henry Ford. All these people thought very, very differently. And they weren't really depending on the status quo. So that's what we want to try and do as well. I want to talk a little bit about the room as well. One of the things that I like to try and do when I approach a design is look at the space you're in. That's very important. Take a look at the space your event is going to take place in and evaluate it on a few different parameters. There are some logistical parameters you want to think about. There's restrictions, there's size of the room. But what about the design of the room that exists? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Can you complement the existing design? versus trying to cover the existing design. I want to talk a, a bit about those things as well. Um, this was uh, an event we did, and one of the things that we tried to do, which worked out really well, is this is the hotel ceiling up here. So we located the structure, structure right below it with my giant mirror ball. Come to see my friend Steve. Right below that ceiling structure. And what it did, by placing it there, by locating the truss there, I won because now the ceiling of the venue looks like it's part of my design. If I moved that truss somewhere else, it still would have been a cool truss. The ceiling still would have been a cool ceiling. Now they're together, they're one big thing. So think about where you're going, utilize the space, don't try and fight the space. Um, another thing to think about, this is a different event, you can see I'm partial to great big trust structure sometimes. This particular space though, this was a small cocktail event for um, 2,500 people. And the ceiling in this party room was about 80 feet. The challenge there for me, and for any designer, was to try and create more of a human scale. Because if you put even a large bunch of people that are six foot tall in a space that has 80 feet above them, it's going to feel cavernous. You need to bring that ceiling down. Lighting helps a lot. Keep it dark up there, keep it light down here. But I chose to fill that space with the truss structure. On the walls, we put screens and interactives and go go projections. And it was a pretty fun event. There's another shot of it. You can see that ceiling just goes up and up and up and up. But your eye doesn't go up there. We're still. 20 something feet in the air with this, way above the people. But we're trying to get the ceiling down, create a human scale. And, and this is a sense where we had to fight that existing room. We didn't want to leave that cavernous space up there for them. So filling it really helped us to get things down there. The other thing that this does, when you're talking about budget and you may not have a lot of money, 
is if you create a large iconic something in the space, it draws people's eye. Rather than trying to fill the space with dozens of smaller things, which might not have as large an impact, you're sometimes better off creating one large iconic draw. That everyone's, their eyes are all going to go to that and I'll say, wow, that's cool. And then what's on the periphery of the room doesn't take on as much importance, so you don't have to invest your money into that. The other thing in this picture that I want you to look at is the DJ. We had to raise the DJ up when you're thinking about these events as well, especially larger events. Um, I know that um, on some smaller events, your DJ sometimes sets up on the floor, he's on a little stage maybe, 16 inches off the ground. It's hard to locate him, it's hard to see. By raising him up, he's up about 12 feet in the air. Everyone in the room and on the dance floor can see the DJ. So he can interact. If you get a really good DJ, they want to be able to interact with their guests. So give them the tools to do it. It's all about staging in the room. So think about where your attendees are coming from, how they're coming in, what's their first view when they get to the room. When they walk in, what do they see? We staged this so the first thing they saw was this gigantic lit truss structure up in the air. It drew their eyes, it drew them into the room. It was actually animated that uh, piece in the middle here is actually a, a globe. It's not a mirror ball, it's a globe and it spun. And it had the, um, the locations around the world of our clients' headquarters picked out in little LED lights on it which no one in the party saw, but my client who writes the checks know who was there. So they were happy because we were helping them to push their idea and their brand. Um, so think about what people are going to see when they walk in the room. Your first impression is your biggest impression, and you want to make sure that uh, you catch their eye. This I'm showing you because I'm going to give you an example of something that doesn't work. This is the Park Plaza Hotel in Boston. It is a fantastic venue. It is a great space for weddings and events of all kinds. My clients, when they chose this venue to do a small trade show in, I first off said, ooh, trade show, it's tough in that room. It doesn't really lend itself to trade show. It's more of a social venue. It's a little opulent. But they insisted they want to do their trade show in this room. Not only did they want to do their trade show, they wanted to do their futuristic themed trade show in this room. <laughs> I tried, I tried. Couldn't we do something else? Couldn't we do Regency? Couldn't we do like Revolutionary War? We're in Boston, come on. I can imagine guys in powdered wigs and swallowtail coats marching around in here having a trade show. I can't imagine Space Man. Doesn't work. So we fought, fought, fought the existing decor of the room. And sometimes you lose the battle like I did with clients. Um, they really, really wanted their futures to trade show. And that's what they got. And I don't hate it, but I don't think of it as my best work. Because I can still see these chandeliers through all that stuff. I can still see the balconies. I can still see a lot of that opulent Regency style room peeking through. And this picture was taken to show it in its best light. Don't, don't misunderstand. <laughs> If you move around the room and took some different views, it gets worse. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the things you need to think about when you're thinking about your existing space. If you can avoid finding it, if your client is open to suggestion, think about what it is. Nowadays people build conference centers like this and they're gloriously bland. You can do whatever you want in a room like this. It's beige all over. It, it creates a great challenge for us as designers to do some fun and interesting things. But if you end up in one of the older hotels or a themed hotel or something like this, if there's a very strong color palette, you don't want to fight it. Fighting the existing decor means you're spending your dollars to do something that no one's going to notice. You're either covering stuff up for the sake of covering it, you're not enhancing it all, you're just trying to make it desperately go away. You need to try and manage your client expectations. I failed on this one. They thought it was a good event, but I felt that I failed because I should have, I should have been able to talk them out of this event. Um, I didn't. But um, right from the get-go, you want to try and learn to manage your client's expectations. 
and talk about budget as soon as soon as you can. The sooner you talk about budget, the better you can do your job. Because you don't want to design something for them that they ultimately will not be able to afford. Because then they fall in love with something they cannot have. And what they're going to do then is they're going to start to water that design down. Well, what if we take out this? What if we take out that? What if we don't do this part of it? Can I afford it now? Sure you can, but it's no longer the design that you fell in love with. And maybe the parts that we had to take away so that you could afford it, now it's just <clears throat> What was once wow is not eh. So if you can get the budget out of your client early on, if you can get a budget range out of your client early on, you can do a much better job of servicing them. And tell them flat out, say, Yes, when you tell me your budget, I'm going to spend every red cent of it. That's what a budget is for. And if you want to try and keep me to a certain number, tell me the number. If you know you have 10000 to spend, but you think you want to only spend eight, tell me eight, and I'll do my best to get to eight. But if I design a $15,000 event or a $20,000 event, and you only have 10, but you wanted to spend eight, we're way far apart. And the converse is true as well. If the client has $50,000 to spend and they don't tell you, and you go in with a $10,000 design, they're going to go, I just don't think it's big enough for me to spend $50,000 on. Let's give it to the next bidder. So information is key. Knowing your client's budget is so important. Not to take every red cent from them, but to do the job that they're asking you to do. One thing to remember is that the client is always right. Everyone hears that? Is it true? Absolutely true. But we're the experts. You're the expert, we're the expert, you're the expert. You know what to do, you know your jobs. You have trained, you will continue to train. You do this every day of your lives. You plan events, you have appropriate budgets. They don't. They, most of our clients plan an event once a year. Maybe it's their once a year company, whatever. Sometimes we get lucky and we're working with a professional planner who's an in-company planner and they do this month after month after month and they understand things better. They're great to work with. But if you get someone in a company who 90% uh, of the year they work in administration and then one month out of the year they get to plan the company event, the big holiday party or the summer picnic or whatever it might be, they're not an expert at this. They lean on us. So it's our job to inform them and let them know that uh, the best way to get things done is to tell us your budget. And don't rush once they tell you the budget. If you have a great idea, do not rush with your great idea. Because a quick idea is an inexpensive idea. Because it's very difficult if you are talking with a client at your first meeting and they're telling you all this great stuff and they tell you what they want and you blurt out your great idea, say, well, what if we did this and we built a giant spaceship in the middle of the ballroom and then blah, 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 blah. Go, they say, great, let's do that. Success, we have sold them your idea. Unfortunately, how do you not value that idea that you spent two minutes coming up with? So take in the information, give them back a little information, maybe throw out a few ideas, take the time you need to present your proposal. Don't give it to them right there. Don't give it to them the very next morning. Because the hardest thing that we all do is value our design services. It's easy to charge for the stuff. It's easy to say, well, that big spaceship in the middle of the room is going to cost you $10,000. What is your idea worth? Because that is the one thing that's unique to you. Even if the thing that you came up with was an interesting way to light the room, an interesting way to utilize um, components that you can rent anywhere. Those commodity items. Why do they need your idea? It's your idea. How do you value it? So sit on those ideas a little bit. Let them germinate. You can tease them out to your client, but don't just give it away. Our designs, our ideas are the most important things that we have to sell. Um, I want to talk about this. The cubic foot rule. Um, one of the things to think about is that uh, when you're creating a design in a room, especially if you're on a tight budget, you can put one of something or a lot of somethings. 
They need to fill the same cubic space. This is uh, Agua de Spain. I showed a picture like this the last time I spoke. And everyone said, where is that? It's Agua de uh, Portugal. For some reason in Portugal, they love to hang things in the streets. There's another street where they have bird cages hung. There's different, um, different <coughs> versions of these umbrella streets. It's, it's, it's glorious, it's beautiful. There are hundreds and hundreds of umbrellas. If I hung a single umbrella in there, no one would notice. Oh, look, an umbrella. That's cool. You hang hundreds of umbrellas, now you have it. So the cubic foot rule is, you can, if you have an umbrella, you either need a lot of them, or a really big one. <laughs> they need to take up the same cubic foot. Because if you take something and you blow it up and you make it gigantic, whether it's a rubber ducky or a push pin, when it's giant, it's cool. We all marvel at something when it's giant. And it takes up a certain cubic foot. So if you can't afford to create a giant umbrella, and you can't afford a giant rubber ducky or whatever, you need to think about the cubic footage that that takes up. And then use a lot of umbrellas. Or a really giant clothespin. Isn't that cool? A regular clothespin is, eh, it's a clothespin, who cares? But 40 foot tall clothespin? Grabbing the planter, that's kind of cool. Now, this is an art installation, really not event work, but the point is, if you only have one, it needs to be really big and aggressive. Balloons, regular balloons. If I had one hanging in this room, no one would notice it. You put in a few hundred, now you notice it. Inflatables are a great way, balloons, if you will. I know sometimes balloons get a bad rap, sometimes it was balloons. It's very kid's birthday party. Inflatables are a great way to create something large without a lot of setup cost, without a lot of um, shipping cost, because they travel so compactly. But if you get something really large and inflatable on a short budget, you can create some really amazing things. Even regular balloons, not just custom balloons. If you find someone that knows what you're doing with them, they can create some pretty amazing things. Now this took two and a half weeks to set up in a mall. I don't expect you to do it for your one night event. But what I'm, the reason for showing you these photos sometimes is to just get your minds working about different ways of using something. These are just standard balloons. These aren't specialty balloons. The guy who makes <laughs> balloon animals uses the same ones. But they made something really interesting. Something really impressive because it's gigantic. And no one's ever seen anything like it. So you change your thinking, change your thoughts, think about stuff in a, di a different way, and uh, hopefully it will start to create the germ of some new ideas, new ways of thinking about everyday items, new ways of approaching design. As we also seem to have fallen into a rut of approaching it in the same way. Another thing, when we're talking about changing the way you think about things, and everyday items, I have a few examples of some amazing things that were so simple, like this. Does anyone remember the song Anticipation? The Heinz ketchup, and doing this, trying to get the ketchup out? Am I too old? I'm dating myself. <laughs> Someone had the brilliant idea to flip the label on the bottle. Now it lives top down. Now the ketchup always comes out. And we've got people who don't even know that song anymore. Anticipation and the, the aggravation of trying to get the ketchup out of the bottle because of course it always works. There was no new inventive technology. No one spent millions of dollars creating a new bottle. They flipped the label over. Now they store it that way. Brilliant. How about this idea? Mm -hmm. What new brilliant technology do they use? Do you think if you're across the street you notice that? Would it stick in your mind? There's no new technology there either. This is a Coca-Cola ad for their new ripped bottle. Came out a few years ago. The sign is made of Velcro. If you stand close to it, it grabs you. There's no new technology there. It's just a new and interesting way to utilize some existing technology, something that no one thought of before. We created a new way to use it. Now, it's something amazing. It's something like, oh my god, that's so much fun. So I want to show you a quick video. It's 
about three minutes long. All the uh, PowerPoint pundits will tell you that it is way too long for a video in the middle of a presentation. I don't care. The reason I want to show you this video is, uh, again, it's another Coca-Cola piece of Coca-Cola advertising. But they took existing technology, they packaged it together in a brand new way, and they created an event where there was no event. And there's a secondary level to this, because when you see this video, the content is, is pretty aggressive. The act of watching the video, the expertise with which they edited the video, the music behind the video, is we're all going to get to watch an event. The relationship between India and Pakistan is one that has seen a lot of lows. It's stressful, it's tense. It seems it's not improving and it's getting worse. It's only been 60 years that we have been apart. Before that, we were living harmoniously together. I think all the strife would go away if you took away the barbed wires in the middle of the two countries. It saddens me that we have this neighbor that we can't even go visit. They have this perception which they ingrained in the head that that's the bad guy. But when they actually meet them, they realize, you know what, you're just like me. Mainly because there's no communication. They're near us, but we have no access to them. And it's sad, because together I think we would do wonders. Creating an environment where young people can exchange ideas, thoughts, gestures, and take away that communication gap that exists. If I have any opportunity to go to India, I'll surely go there. The whole idea of actually touching hands, it's like communicating with each other without words. And that action speaks louder than anything else. This is what we're supposed to do, right? We are going to take minor steps so that we are going to solve bigger issues. It is more about, you know, how similar we are as opposed to how different we are. Togetherness, humanity, this is what we want, more and more exchange. Because they're not going to remember the giant spaceship in the middle of the room. They're going to remember their thoughts, their feelings, and what they experienced while they were there. That is going to make your event a success. That's how you can tell your clients that you were successful because there's buzz. People talk about your event. They remember your event. And that only happens if you can get them engaged on an emotional level. One of the things that happens most, most often now with my clients is they want interactivity. They want recognition. They want people to know why they're at the event and who did it for them. So without being too in your face, Coca-Cola created that fun box. Everyone knows it's a Coca-Cola box. It didn't matter because these people were connecting emotionally. And I know that when I watch that video, I'm drawn in, I'm engaged. The first time I saw it, I was watching the screen going, oh my God, this is brilliant. And it's a couple of touch screens, it's a couple of cameras. There's nothing new there that is inaccessible to you if you call up PSAV or whoever your local AV provider is, there's nothing new in that video in those boxes. 
it all exists. We have access to all of it. And not that expensive. So think about that again, and I can't impress upon you guys enough. That it's the creativity that will get you success. It's the creativity that will win your jobs, that will make stuff exciting and interesting. Um, this is a designer, favorite designer of mine, uh, Robert Grant. Be the shout, not the echo. Originate your ideas. Yes, it's great when we see a cool idea and we can copy it and do it. But how much greater is it if we're the first, the first ones to do it? Um, and that is what is going to set you apart when you go to design things. And that creativity will come through in your designs and that creativity, when you learn how to value it and sell it, is how you will be able to be more successful in your businesses, command higher prices for your work, and be able to say to them, I have a great idea, my ideas are worth this much money. Not the stuff that goes along with the ideas, I'm going to charge you for this stuff too. My ideas are worth money. Um, so think differently, you find inspired solutions in everyday things. This is a fun ceiling, it's made out of two liter soda bottles with colored water in the bottom. You see it? All those little flower hands. It's kind of fun, looks like it's taken off a long time to do. Here's some other uses. Think about this from a green perspective. They're using them as paint stencils. That'd be a fun interactive. Depends on the client. But these are light fixtures made of the, oops, sorry. Back to that. Made of the, uh, the ends of two liter soda bottles spun together. I think they're really pretty. Um, this is a company in Boston called C3 Productions that did an event for uh, Saucony, secret company, they did a block party. They put up this piece of chain link fence and use the red solo cups stuck into the fence holes to create the company's logo. What do you think their cost was to produce that? I, I, I hesitate to tell you what they charged for it because, okay, but it, they weren't charging for that, they were charging for the creativity to come up with the idea. Sometimes taking something away can be just as exciting. When you think about those big spaces, big cavernous spaces, it's not always about trying to fill it. What if you don't fill it? What if you create an island in the middle that everyone wants to go to? This is a highway in LA, and instead of graffiti, people have started scrubbing the grime off the walls to create these beautiful images. The dark part is the dirt from cars going by. The light areas, they've cleaned the, cleaned the grime off the walls. This is uh, a general named Andres Amador, who goes around and creates these great things on beaches around the world. That's, that's Andres right there. He walks around with a little rake and creates these in the sand. Just takes away the top level of the sand. The moist sand down below is a little darker. Creates these great images. Cost for a beach event? When do people come down to your beach event? A guy with a rake and a little bit of time. Not a lot of stuff. It's the helicopter. You got to It's the helicopter. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> Thanks. <Steve. laughs> so, the Discover Four Challenge. This year, what I'd like to do with you guys is a little interactivity. I want to um, think about things that you own and think about ways that you can use it in a non-traditional way. Let's come up with four ways of using something. I'll give you some examples. It's a lovely shelf. It's a shipping pallet. I know, I know. So one use is a shipping pallet, the next is a shelf. It doesn't really lend itself to our industry unless you're doing a grunge bar and you're creating a back bar on it. How many of you have some shipping pallets sitting around that you're not doing anything with? And I have tons, thank you. So now they're useful. Now they are something that you are not going to get money from your client because I'm giving you this great back bar. And they've got the bottles in it, they've got trays and all kinds of stuff on it. Uh, this is a set that I did for a client and what I want you to look at in this picture is these columns. Just this square part of the columns. 
Then they are again in a party setting instead of a meeting stage setting. There it is again on its side as a retail shelf. I already had it. I already owned it. I just took the plastic coating out that diffuses the colored light, laid it on its side. Well, I had to do a little work to it to make it pretty. But the steel structure I already owned. I didn't have to make that again. I used it again in a very different way. This is um, a bench from my friends at AFR Furniture. It's called the Hayden Bench. It's a very simple bench. Black, square, nothing very outrageous about it. You can certainly use it as a bench. Two together makes a lovely coffee table. Again, not so extravagant, not so out there. These folk decided they would make a tiered buffet table by putting the bench on top of the table. The point is, that's not the intended use for that piece of furniture. But they had it, so instead of saying we need to build something tiered, throw the bench up here, let's make it into what we need. Some other examples. <clears throat> I'll explain to you, this is a, a trade show booth I did for a client. These panels are four by eight foot. They're square tube construction, square steel tube construction with a core clasp backing so that it transmits light very easily. I own a bunch of them. I built a bunch of them because I keep coming up with interesting ways to use them, so I keep building more because they turned into very profitable for us. Here it is again, lit by my friend Steve. What I've done is I've layered the translucent plastic to create this stylized foliage. Same framework, same backing. I've just added a little bit to it, and now it's something completely new. Now it's got clear plexi in it. I've created a little soundstage room for a client on the trade show floor. Same steel frame, we're using it again. And I'm jumping ship and showing you this for a reason I'll get to in one second. Um, these uh, fence railing sections we built for a client that always, always, always wants to have stadium seating at their meetings. So we build the stadium seating. Rather than use something ugly, we built them something nice and stylized that goes with the theme of, the theme of their event. Well, now I have them, and I have to use them, don't I? I'm going to stick to what I keep saying. So here are those same square panels with cut snowflakes on them. And here's the fence sections vertically, <coughs> creating something decorative to wrap around the column for a winter theme event. So you know what I'm getting at? Using it four different ways? Who here, because now I'm going to make you talk back at me, who here has something in their inventory that they use in more than one way? Way in the back. You. No, you. Don't turn around. Okay. Sure. Oh, I mean, I just, we do. You um, do. What do you have? Okay. I know that uh, I have a lot of drape in my inventory, and we use that like you would think. We use it to create, to, to mask off walls. We use it to create walls down the middle of a room. We've used it hanging swag through the ceiling to create fun ceiling treatments. Does anyone have an idea of another way we could use drape? Tablecloths, thank you. It's not what it's supposed to be for, but it's there. We own it. Why not use it? As long as we're not going to destroy it, depends on what they're doing. If they're having a medieval banquet and eating with their hands, maybe don't want to use the expensive drink for that one. But, um, you know, you could use it as table skirting. You could use it as stage skirting. A lot of times what happens is I go into um, meetings with um, executives and they're having their meeting and they want a great stage and then the AV company comes in and they say, well, we're going to put the screens left and right and we've got black velour dress kits. Like that. And it's always black velour, isn't it? Unless you happen to have some nice colored drape and you can start to make your own dress kit around that. Take it and pin it on, um, clamp it on, do it side to side and create a fun dress kit that steps outside the normal that is always black. Does anyone else have any other cool examples for me? 
<coughs> Windows, yeah. Decorative. Yeah. Uh-huh. Just the window in the sash and you hang it, does it have the glass in it still? Yeah. Hang things in the windows, cool. Use them as, do you always do them vertically? Can you hang, have you hung them flat? Fun. You can put, um, you can put decals on the glass and create changes, create stained glass if you wanted to with lighting gel and things like that. Um, anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, we, uh, we have a client, a nonprofit, and they have a giving tree um, to utilize it mm -hmm. for uh, clients to, or for the guests to make donations. I'm like, oh my God, we take that tree now, we use it as partition, we yeah. use it as bar backs, Absolutely. Yeah. as walls to display food on. Great. Um, yeah, as sitting pieces. Yeah. To utilize it for the so Exactly. And and that's, that's another great point when you say recycled is the fact that you're reusing things that are already in your inventory helps you because A, if you've got a client without a lot of money, you can be profitable without having to charge them to make something new. That makes you attractive as a planner, as a designer. Um, it also makes you attractive to companies and people, and it should be all of us these days, when you say that you are a green company, and you're green because you're reusing things, you don't just do your event and throw it away. We're reusing things, we're saving them, we're reusing them, we're recycling them, and creating something new out of them. And that's important in today's day and age. A lot of clientele, um, a lot of companies demand that of us as we move forward. So, my part of this is, is kind of wrapped up. I just want to leave you with this little note. The act of creativity, being careful, guarantees sameness and mediocrity, which means your work will be invisible. Be reckless, be bold, have your work seen and remembered by being different and depend upon your creativity. The creative, which is what all of you deal with, and the technical, which is kind of what makes your shoulders go up when you talk to the client and you're not quite sure and they start asking you things about the lighting and the audio visual. That's, that's my world. Um, and, and we enjoy it very much. We kind of go right ahead here. So I want, to, I want to start by asking who, um, I see differentiation between event planning and event designing, and I know many of you do both services, but they are different things. Can I have a raise, uh, raise of hands here as to who are uh, primarily event designers, okay, planners, all right, um, other, anybody in the technical, technical end of the, this world? Thank you, Damani. Damani, back, back there. What, are, what else, who else do we have? What other kinds of professions do we have? Uh, yeah. well, we're, we're academic, so we're academic? full-time Okay. Rental company. In my world, education is key for, for event planners and event designers, because I think it's so important for you guys to understand just enough to make you feel comfortable. I'm not going to sit there and talk to you about the newest XJ7 model or whatever, because you're going to forget about it and you don't need to know that anyways. For me, it's about, it's about concepts and you feeling comfortable so that when you're trying to talk to your client, develop a design or, or, or the vision for that project, you have some tools, some tips, some things in the back of your head to make it, to make it work for you. So, um, this, this may seem obvious, but... <coughs> A good working relationship with your team is so important to be collaborative with all of your partners, not just your lighting partner, um, but your, your scenic partner, your, your uh, caterers, all of that. We all say that we do it, but you'd be surprised at how many times we go through the process and so much information is left out because they didn't think it was important for us to know. And we end up having to kind of guess at it. Um, or, or get on worse, we get on site and we're surprised by it and then, and then we or somebody else has to deal with it. In the lighting world, it can be very difficult because we have sort of uh, certain limitations to be able to light whatever is being put in there for scenic or other elements. Limitations could be power, limitations could be rigging for us. And when that's moved, well, we're not going to put it on this wall, we're going to put it on this wall because there's a door there now. 
that may be nothing for your guys to move that or the husband to move that, but from a lighting standpoint, that can really affect what happens. Because I may have to put a light in a certain position that was perfect when it was at the back wall, but when you put it on the side wall, now my light's causing a shadow that doesn't work, or it's, or it's elongated, or it's in somebody's eyes, or something like that. That information, had it been sort of discussed, or planned, or brainstormed at the beginning, would have been really good. We're not mind readers. We really are. We have to work with all of you. Um, communication, information, and at the end of the day, trust. If you don't trust your vendors, then, then they can't perform for you, or you shouldn't be using them, really, at, at the end of the day. You should have that sort of honest discussion. I don't feel comfortable, maybe I have to, I always have to feel like I'm behind you or have to talk <coughs> to you about different things. Um, it's important for us to know that you trust what we do. Don't work in a bubble. Um, it's not done intentionally, we understand that. You have a lot of things, you have a lot of partners that you're working with, but for us it's important to be part of the collaborative process. Uh, in addition, we work in a lot of different venues and many times where our connection is again with the event planner, the event producer, and not so much with the venue, and that hurts us. We really like to be able to connect with the venue. Particularly in lighting, there's so much that we have to do, including overhead rigging, there's a lot of restrictions in dealing with that. Electrical, atmospherics, if we happen to be using that, there may be permitting, there may be things we can and can't do that all affect the venue that we're in or the personnel in the venue that we're in for it. Uh, logisticals as well. As you know, they sell, they sell rooms left and right, and so they don't really care about the two hours between there. They can sell that time between your event and somebody else's event, they will, but that affects what we do. And, and if we know ahead of time what we're dealing with, we can adapt our design to it. If we go in the day before we find out that, that this room is sold, that can really affect everything we do as a group. Um, brainstorming, as I talked about, is key. Has anybody heard the term BSM, or value stream mapping? It's, some, it's something that's used in manufacturing, but it's very key with what we do. Basically, value stream mapping is taking your event on a, on a, on a wall, sticky pads, and just laying it out in a linear format from the beginning to the end. So, so client calls to client has paid, everything is away. And everything in between, site inspections, meetings, uh, vendors, sub-rentals that you have to do, catering, <coughs> second calls, all of that. Why is this important? What does this allow you to do? Well, when you're doing this with your team and collaborating, you'll find every time you'll be able to focus in on certain areas and handle some of the issues that you wouldn't necessarily think about. You, a, a logistical issue about loading in when you see, you know, load-in time, somebody might raise their hand in the meeting and go, well, we need two hours at the loading dock. Maybe it's a one-truck loading dock. And the caterer says, well, I also need da 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 That's going to be answered in the early part of your, your discussions for it. So value stream mapping is a very important part of it. It's, it's, it's even more than sort of brainstorming, which is important, obviously, for the concept and the goal and the vision that you're bringing to the client. This allows you to really hone in and take care of a lot of the issues for it. So let's sort of uncover and talk about some of the things um, that we go here. Uh, the entrance for us is very important. And sometimes the entrance is at the end of a parking lot, hundreds of, uh, hundreds of yards away, and this is such a big area, and they don't have signage or it's dark, you need to be able to somehow tell the people how to get there. Tell the people this is where it's happening. We've done some things where you, we, we light the building or we highlight the building in such a way when there isn't signage or another way to do it. Certainly it's also done uh, in a small venue as well when you're, when you're entering somewhere to kind of start the process for the people. What are they going to be in for? Set the tone, set the mood for them. It doesn't have to be uh, too difficult. Bob, uh, we'll, we'll show a picture later, I think it's one of Deb's pictures of the, the escalator, yeah. which can be an entrance. Very quick, very easy to be able to do that. Um, it, this is a horrible picture, but it's an, an important thing. You guys deal with a lot of events that have registration tables, and whether those are man registration tables at like a conference <coughs> here, or our wedding registration tables where people pick up their placards. 
Lighting those registration tables is huge. Think of the people, particularly people that are older. It's very difficult when you're talking about a, a darkened environment, which may be nice for the setting, but you can't see the names on the table. Now, what does that do? Well, it forces people to stop, it forces people to take a lot more time. Maybe there's a log jam in there. It's a very simple thing to be able to correct, but it's something sort of you can put in your toolbox that, you know what, you need something to be able to light that. You can't always put it under the light of the building. You may have to bring something in to be able to do that. Um, this was sort of an, an entryway work as well. Everything was really upstairs, and they just wanted a way to kind of focus the attention on the upstairs. And doing it as a two-tone helped a little bit better than just a single color on columns going, going throughout there. Um, technology, uh, LED certainly is a technology that all of you are familiar with, have seen, whether it's votives or whether the light vendors and partners that you use also use them. But these little pieces out here are, are tiny and very powerful. These are, these are about 12 feet tall, and this is in the daylight, and you're able to see them. Very effective and obviously wireless to be able to, to use those for it. Bars. Bars and food tables. Another thing that is oftentimes forgotten about in, in a room. You spend a lot of money on catering, a lot of money for, for bars. People need to be able to see. Sometimes it's a great focus to tell them, particularly in large rooms, there's a, there's a lit area for them to go. It's not difficult to do it, but it's an element that you need to do. Food tables. You know, you spend a lot of money, or your clients spend a lot of money on food. You want it to look good. Sometimes it's not just the color, the, the, the light, the intensity, but it is the color. It's the color temperature that you want to bring to that so that people can, can go to it, know where it is, know what they're eating. A lot of people really have, they have restrictions. Maybe there's some signage that talks about what, the, uh, what it is, and somebody may have a shellfish um, allergy or something like that. So that's very important and not very difficult, not an expensive thing to kind of add. Because oftentimes you're thinking about, well, we want to uplight the room, maybe we want to light the stage, and you're not thinking about the other little elements in here. Here's an example of what happens when you don't. Uplighting can be great, but uplighting isn't the answer for everything. You know, the tables look pretty underneath there, but I can't see anything that's on that table, whether it be placards or food. So some little, a little pin spot or a little something, a little hole in there. This is, a, this is part of the collaboration process when you're talking with your lighting designer to let them know what you have. And a good lighting designer will come back to you with feedback and ask questions about that sort of thing. Um, the, before, the before and after, I wanted to kind of show this. This is, this is kind of simple, but, but being able to do this just simply warmed the room up just enough. It wasn't expensive to do. We did a little, a little uh, fall foliage on the uh, creating a dance floor as well. It became very easy. And if you notice also the, the, the floral pieces as well picked up very nicely when you added some, some lighting in there. You spend a lot of money on centerpieces. That's, that's another big thing as well. Um, stages. When you guys have entertainment for it. Oftentimes what happens is, well, the band has their own uh, a little bit of a package. Well, maybe the DJ has some dance floor lighting, so we'll swing that around for it. That may not always be adequate for what you guys are trying to do. So make sure that the conversation is in there for the stage. Maybe it's a 360 degree stage. You've got to cover it from all sides. You've got audience everywhere for that to be able to do it. Maybe it's a single performer in a small little area. You still want to kind of highlight for it. You know, Talk about the priorities of the event and, and make sure that you're covering each one of these little, little aspects for it. Another example, you know, a large stage. This is actually a, a stage in Boston where the event was on the stage. That's actually the, the audience out there, the, the, the uh, auditorium. Um, but they had, they had a speaker and some uh, uh, singers, a small chorus on there. It helps you, lighting always helps you draw the attention to where you want it to go for it. Um, here's an interesting example. The client didn't want it, us to light from the waist up. This is Earth's shoes. They're, they're selling shoes. They're not selling anything else. Where do you think they want the attention to go? They don't want you to see her face up here. They want you right down there. may seem a little odd, and if we had gone in and somebody had just said, yes, we have a fashion show, we need to light it, even a fashion show for shoes. But there was a collaboration process where they described and talked about the focus for that was really on the shoes, and we, they, they need the people to be able to see that. So it seemed odd, but it did the trick. It brought it in. 
Sometimes you don't have a stage. You're creating that stage for it. This was also a, another fashion show where we, we had to do that, had to bring it in and focus it correctly for it. Uh, bringing down ceilings, is a, Bob talked about it a little bit, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, this is one way with B lights and pin spotting the table, certainly for the centerpiece, but also in a dimly lit room, which is very common, being able to uh, add some additional lighting to that table. The pin spot can do that. Maybe it's a soft light that's a little bit larger on the table. Here was an example that actually saved the client a little bit of money. The, the, the venue actually had some built in. Um, pin spot bay, so we didn't have to bring it in, and it allowed us to still kind of highlight uh, the different areas on the table for that. So, and it just was a little bit wider so that they could get the table, they could get the lighting that they wanted, so that the people, the rest of the room was very dark. So, um, we talk about pin spots a lot, and, and pin spots can be very difficult because there's some rooms, and I'll use this room as an example, where we can't rig from the ceiling. There's, there's no hanging points from the ceiling. Now there are some technology that allows us to perhaps put a magnet on some things, but if I'm if I'm putting a light, the perimeter is the only place that I can light from, and I've got a table in the center, then I really have to be careful because my angle is going to be in those guest eyes, and that's that's important for the lighting designer for you guys to understand. Just sticking a pole on the side doesn't make it work. The further away you have to go, the higher up you have to go, and that may not always always be possible. You may be in a ten a ten foot room. This is great. I first looked at it and said, you know, painted chairs and everything. This is lighting. This is a gobo on these chairs that we were able to, to change throughout the night, but the client loved to be able to do. They're very fun, very festive um, to be able to have that in there. We also love dance floors. There's so much you can do with dance floors. This is a fiber optic dance floor that's very, um, very sort of simple to put together. Um, and all it does is just twinkle. It added, it added so much to the event. Um, being able to take a dance floor and add some texture with gobos. Gobos are, are a lighting designer's best friend. Not a new technology. Hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of gobos, readily available gobos available. And I tell you, the standard gobos, the cost of a standard gobo is about 12 bucks um, in a metal, a metal gobo. Now, that doesn't include the fixture, that doesn't include setting it up, that doesn't include focusing, it doesn't include the design. But the commodity item itself is very inexpensive and so much can be done with it. But it takes the creative, it takes the designer to understand what's needed and what will work or how to carry on a theme uh, when perhaps scenic, if they can't afford to have large scenic pieces, they can carry it on with, with some lighting. Um, here's an example where, again, there was no dance floor, they needed to define a dance floor, and so we actually did it with with the lighting and shuttered it off so that people felt like there was the space that I could go in and play. Very important. I love this one. This is, they, they wanted to create a swimming pool. As you can see on the side here, you've got the little beach chairs and everything <laughs> and the pool in there. And it was a very simple effect that we do as you're running with just a little bit of water, you know, just a little ripple effect. That was not an expensive lighting effect. It's not a projector that's going, going on there. But it allowed the client, if you, gave that experience the client felt they were actually on, on the pool side for it. All right, here's one. I talked about this last year. So important. Uh, how many of you do galas, fundraisers, things in, in that nature? All right. This is going to make your client more money. You have to light the silent auction tables. There, where, how are they going to see these things? The people need to engage. I'll, I'll, use, I'll use this as an example right now. There's no stage lighting in here. So I've got some down lighting, but you're seeing shadows under my eyes, and you're not necessarily seeing my whole face. If, I'm sure you guys have gone, and you'll probably see other seminars as well. No matter how engaging the speaker may be in terms of the content or even their voice, there is a lack of engagement when you don't have proper lighting. It doesn't have to be um, uh, all sophisticated. It doesn't have to be a lot of lighting. But it is important to consider that whenever you have. Maybe it's just a podium with somebody at a podium. A couple of lights makes a difference. So these are a couple quick examples, but this is so important in making sure you light signage that happens within it as well. Um, this, this will increase their, their take on that. So that's, that's a tip you can take back to them. We work a lot in outdoors as well. Sometimes it's not tents, but it's just raw outdoor spaces and courtyards. You have to make sure that you're considering 
lighting then. It might be theme lighting, it might be some ambient lighting to raise the levels for your clients. Um, but something, don't just think that the, 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 for instance, the hanging lights in here are enough for your clients to feel comfortable throughout there. Signage as well, I talked about, uh, is, is very important. A lot of people, particularly in trade shows and things, they spend a lot of money on signage. Lighting, think about lighting it. That's, that's very important. This is a job we actually did with Bond BDA, where this is all texturing. What you see there um, are all, these are all plain. This is a spandex panels, and that's plain, and these are all plain. The texturing was done with gobos. This could be changed throughout the night, and the lighting could be changed throughout the night at a very low, uh, low cost. But it takes the design element, the creativity. Walls in here, these are very plain walls that Bob talked about, even that with the wallpaper in it. You can create wallpaper. Right? We'd love to be able to do that, and that is so inexpensive to do. Um, gobos, I talked about gobos and how inexpensive they are. Custom gobos are still inexpensive as well. Uh, these, are, these are actually some examples of glass gobo, and some of the, the, the uh, ability that glass gives you that metal doesn't is if you consider metal like a stencil. There's little, there's little areas where you have to connect letters like A's and O's and things of that nature, whereas in glass, you don't have to do that. Um, but it also gives you a much crisper image in glass than typically you will get in metal. So if your client Whatever it is, it might be a monogram, as some people call them, for the dance floor, for the wedding, or it might be branding that's going on, um, branding on a wall for that. You probably want to consider a glass gobo, because that's going to give you a much crisper, much straighter image. Um, we do a lot with walls, turning a, a straight wall and just adding a little bit of the pattern and carrying it on to the table. Uh, as, um, Asian lanterns, they've been around for a long time, but some of the LED technology now helps. Years ago, the only way that we could light these is we'd have to, you know, you'd have to have a structure, a small wire of some sort, but we also had to wire them electrically and a little socket, a little light bulb, and you had this cluster of wires when you're talking about this many kind of Asian lanterns. Well, LED technology has allowed, and there's a, there's a company, I'll give a quick plug here, uh, called Fuel Lighting. Uh, Paul Therry, a great guy, developed some wonderful pieces, um, and and the, I'm trying to think of the, the name. He's got he's got them up there. I'm sure he's going to be on the show floor. There's it, it's about this big, and it's a wireless LED. It almost looks like a what we call a C7, the old style Christmas bulb, um, on a little stem, but it is very bright. The remote allows you to to dim it. Um, and you can stick it in there and it can be used as a real light source. It can be put into a lamp, it can be put into this kind of uh, fixture. He also does some pin spots as well, which are, which are amazing for that. Uh, what, what clusters, as Bob said. Uh, clustering a bunch of little things. It was a 60s event that we, that we had done. We also used the same thing. Here was a challenge. We had an outdoor venue where they, they didn't have any electricity, but they just wanted some ambient light. So we used, um, I think it was a little, a little hangers they are stuck in the ground, some of the lanterns and some of those wireless uh, uh, LED fixtures in there, but it had to be enough light for the people to see. And it was very elegant. It was simple to be able to do that. I, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have an evening shot of this, but uh, one of our designers you know, worked with some, uh, uh, some lanterns here with some candles in it and just hung them in a tree at a wedding. And she said it was an afterthought. You know, she, she thought about it. Everything else was focused around the tent and the entrance and everything else. This is what everybody talked about. As Bob was saying, it's, it's, sometimes you don't, you don't know what it is that the people are going to focus in on and like. And, and it doesn't have to be complicated. But it's that thing that they're going to remember when they went to, the, when they went to that uh, event. It's the experience that, that you helped give them.